All right, well, I might get started. Um, so thanks for joining today's um, Taza Thursday session. Um, I need to stop saying yes to things, negotiating boundaries and commitments. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians um, of the country. Um, so I'm on Bejigal and Gadigal country of the Eora Nation. Um, feel free to put the country you're on in the chat if you'd like. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people um, who've joined us today. Um, so just some quick housekeeping. So my name is Anthony Smith. I'm the postgraduate portfolio leader um, for TASA. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the assistance of Laura Simpson-Reeves and Dorinda Tart, who are um, also um, on the TASA postgraduate subcommittee who've helped put together today's event. Um, so today's event is recorded um, and will be put on YouTube. So just be mindful of that in terms of um, showing your video or whatever you say or share. Um, so we'll have a panel discussion with our three panelists who I will introduce shortly. Um, and then there'll be an open Q&A um, in the last 15 minutes. So if you have any uh, burning questions or whatever, um, put them in the chat or save them for the um, Q&A part. So as the title for this event suggests, figuring out boundaries around workloads and negotiate, negotiating a whole range of commitments, including research collaborations, teaching and research assistant work, academic service work, public engagement and more, are key challenges for academic work and for sociologists. So to open up this discussion, we've put together a panel of excellent sociologists at different career stages, who I'll, who I'll introduce now. So we have Emma Bernard, who's a PhD candidate and teaching associate lead in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at University of Melbourne. She works across a number of core subjects in the Masters of Public Health and has previously worked in health promotion and health sector training in alcohol and other drugs, sexual and reproductive health and harm reduction in New South Wales and Victoria. Her research interests include young people and women's health, qualitative research methods and health and research ethics. We have Alfia Possamaya Nezidi, who is a professor, the professor of sociology at the Western Sydney University. She is the current chair of Academic Senate, the president of TASA, and the recent director of the Sydney Sydney, Sydney City Campus. Alfia's recent work includes the Digital Social, Religion and Belief 2019, as well as upcoming books on digital methods and an edited volume on health sociology with Sage and Pearson. Alfia is currently involved in ongoing research that focuses on higher education, risk society, religion, digital sociology, and methodologies. And then third, we have Dr. Catriona Stevens, who's a Forest Prospect Fellow with the SAGE Lab, the Social Care and Aging Living Lab at the University of Western Australia. She completed her PhD in 2020 on the impacts of social class and changing migration policy on trade skilled labor migrants from China to Australia. Her new fellowship project seeks to better understand aged care workers from migrant backgrounds and to develop policy recommendations to attract, retain and support people working in the sector. So I'm excited to hear from the panel. Um, I'd like to start by just sitting on that point about, I think we often hear people across academia, across all stages of career, often saying things like, oh, I just need to, you know, stop saying no, um, yes to things or need to learn to say no. So um, I'm curious for each of the panelists, you know, what, what's your experience of taking on work and service obligations and, and how does all the work kind of accumulate? Where does it start? Um, I might get our fear to start us off. That's funny, <laughs> Anthony. Um, Thank you very much. And thank you for putting the panel together. I, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting everybody from uh, the traditional lands of the Derek Nation of, um, um, sorry, I'm meeting you from the lands of the Derek people of the Derek Nation. Uh, in terms of work, you know, I've been working within academia for long enough to, but, but still have problems of saying no. And I think that this is in part because we as sociologists, I think we're, we're, we're very much driven by passion, 
passion for making change, passion for having an impact. So I myself find it difficult because I get um, driven by that passion and I forget about the invisible work, the invisible work that does not get counted, uh, but you, you, you very much need to remember when you're doing. I think there's different stages within your career as well, where there's a beginning stage where you are frightened to say no. Um, and as you progress, uh, increasingly having a sense of self, um, uh, where you see yourself uh, growing and, and um, the sort of potential pathways that you could be on, because there usually are multiple pathways that you could be on um, uh, within your career and thinking a little bit more about what are the doors that I want to open? What are the doors I want to make sure I keep open um, whilst I you know, very carefully say no to things? And even at this point in my career, I still negotiate all of that. Uh, being mindful of all that invisible work, there's a lot of it. Um, and and when I, when I think about if I say yes to something, I, I think, how long do I think this is going to take? I look at my calendar, my obligations. I triple the time I put the estimate on because that is most likely what the amount of time it's going to take. I just try to be a little bit more strategic. I, I'm sorry to be long-winded here. I just want to end, but maybe we can come back to it later. I think now with everything that's happened with COVID, we are actually in a space where we can collectively reimagine what our work is and how we approach it and really change these conversations that I've heard way too often about the ways that we approach our work um, and, and the difficulties that we, that we face in it. Maybe we could talk about that later. That's great, Althea. Uh, could, could you just elaborate just on that invisible work? What, what is that? Well, I think whatever type of work you're doing, say, for instance, if you are running classes, the invisible work is all of the caretaking work that you give to your students. Um, the invisible work is um, the emails um, that that nobody is really sort of taking into consideration. The invisible work is also the are the service that we give to our discipline. The the um, peer review of articles, um, the type of engagement that that we're going to do. These types of things don't get counted. The types of things that if if, if we're talking about sociologists that are within a university, and that, that's what I'm emphasizing here, there's things that don't get counted. And we live in a very quantified space. And because they don't get counted, they become invisible in certain ways. Whilst I find them very valuable and important, they just, there's not the recognition that they exist and somehow aren't part of our, of our work life. Great, thanks. Emma, could you share your thoughts? So I'll um, start by saying that I am by no means an expert in saying no, and there are several people on this call that can attest to that fact. Um, but I think, you know, sort of Alfia just said that, you know, sort of this changes over one's career. I think it also changes over um, the space of being a, you know, a postgraduate student or, or an ACR sort of within that particular um, chunk of a career too. And reflecting on this topic over the last few weeks, I've really been thinking about how I change the way that I say yes and no to things and how I um, negotiate saying yes or no now as opposed to you know sort of maybe five four or five years ago you know sort of when I when I first started it's very very different um so I don't have any I don't have any you know sort of magic answers but I do think I um there are some things that that people can be mindful of you know sort of some good um yeah good good tips that I think um people can be mindful of so I think yeah it might not it, there's no, never, you know, sort of a perfect solution, but um, I think that you can uh, better manage 
yourself and other people, you know, sort of in their expectations. What would be the, the difference between, because you're saying the difference between five years ago to now, mm. what's the difference for you? I think there are <laughs> stages of being a junior. So being sort of an, an early and a new junior, you sort of might have a very um, uh, different sort of position within your kind of organisational um, situation than you are when you've you know, been around the traps for a bit longer, you know, sort of, and you get to know, it's really about familiarity with your, um, you know, yeah, organisational situation, I think is, is the key difference, you know, sort of, and you learn over time what you can say no to, um, you know, and have a bit more, um, uh, you, yeah, feel a bit more empowered, I suppose, to sort of say yes to, to things and to no to things. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, because there's, there's almost like I think when you start like, oh, someone's asking you something, like, oh, it's an opportunity, like you get really excited and you just want to say yes immediately because you're scared they'll immediately take away if you don't say yes soon enough. Mm. Um, you sort of have to, yeah, you, you learn over time, I think, to give that a bit more space and thinking. Yeah, definitely. Kat, if you could just build on... Yeah, sure. Um, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, Anthony, when you say it's this fear of missing out on a great opportunity. Um, and, and I think the other thing that many of us struggle with when offered new things to collaborate on or new projects to, to consider is this multiple pathways idea that, that Alfie just mentioned. None of us have a crystal ball and there are so many projects new initiatives that we'd like to be involved in and we don't know which of them are going to come to fruition and there's a huge amount of labor a huge amount of you know unrecognized time that goes into getting new ideas up and running and since we don't know which ones are going to to develop and we don't know which ones are necessarily going to align perfectly with our own objectives and career imaginaries it can be tempting to say yes to everything and to put in more time than we have and more energy than we have in the hope of seeing some of them, some of them really, really come to life. Um, I must say, I have historically been quite bad at saying no. Um, and this is really only a muscle that I'm starting to develop now. Um, and this, I think, links in with that you know, career stage, and that, that, that early, early and that, that mid early and that slighter later early. And I think I might be in the slighter rate later early window now um before I got my PhD I don't think I said no to anything really um be on this committee organize this event teach this unit do a guest lecture analyze some data be on a research consultancy draft an application you know yes 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 and yes and um I think I only recall saying no once and that was in semester one last year and I was already teaching four units across two institutions and then we went online with COVID and then a colleague asked me to tutor a fifth unit. And at that point, I did say no. But I think that was only because I was, you know, already drowning and it would have been quite impossible. So amidst that timeline with all of those, those yeses, clearly there were times when the, the deadlines aligned and the work accumulated and it was really tough. And I think that sort of cyclical process of projects crunching together and things becoming unsustainably busy is, is, is something that we need to, to watch for and defend against as much as we can, because it's really, it's really tough. And I don't, I gather from more senior colleagues that that doesn't get easier as time goes on. Um, but I guess the flip side of all that experience and all the different jobs I did as a PhD student was the way that positioned me post PhD, not only, um, to secure a postdoc, but also to handle you know, the great diversity of different kinds of work and tasks that working in academia does entail. Um, I'd like to think I can now be a little bit more judicious in what I do, um, not least because I'm now trying to take on projects and tasks because they align with broader long-term objectives that I've tried to map out. Um, and perhaps a little bit less driven by fear, or, or no, maybe fear is the wrong word, but, um, but less driven by uncertainty and not knowing which of those multiple pathways or activities will lead to the next uh, big thing. Um, however, I think 
is still the hardest, the hardest part of this process. And again, I don't think that necessarily gets easier as the years go on. Certainly, I know more senior people who are struggle with the same kind of questions. Um, one thing I did do, um, I started a post, a two-year postdoc about a month ago. And when I did that, I created uh, what I like to call an intentions matrix. Um, so what I so that's kind of mapping high level activities against broad fields. So they were like research operations, intersectoral communication and impact, publishing, funding, and oh, mentoring and supervision. So kind of the, the, the multiple broad fields that we all need to be doing all the time to, to, to progress, I suppose. Um, and that was really good for focusing the mind. Um, I can't say I always stick to it, but when I'm what I'm trying to do now, and I'm not necessarily very good at it, what I'm trying to do now is when I'm offered a new opportunity, I'm trying to reflect on how that maps onto that matrix to determine if it's something I should be saying yes to, or maybe something I should try to decline. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I think yeah, because you get a, it's it's really hard to know what's what what your future career is going to be like. As you say, you're trying to sort of plant all these seeds, or you know, hope something will grow. That's a really good point. And if I could make one one more extension to that, another important consideration is discipline or field of research. And if you've got quite a diverse and interdisciplinary background, um, as I do, I'm across anthropology, sociology, Asian studies. There's there's a lot in the mix there. And that means there are lots of different ways you can go at this kind of critical post PhD juncture. Um, but you can't do everything, can you? Like, that's not possible. So if you spread yourself too thin, then you kind of dilute the message about what you're doing and, and who you are. Your whole identity as a researcher can potentially get diluted. So, so yeah, I think working out who I am and what I want to do has been a really important part of this, this transition. Kat, I was wondering if we could pick back up on that time you know you first sort of said no to a request last <laughs> year what what was that like really hard and I sat there for so long thinking well maybe you know I could take on there are only another 40 students and this and the first assessment's already been done because this was a mid-semester change of tutor request and really trying to justify to myself how I could go from you know a 55 hour week to a 65 hour week without it impacting my family any more than it already had and Clearly, that was hard. And then, surprisingly, when I went back to the, the colleague who'd asked me to do it and I told him everything I had on, he said, well, goodness, we wouldn't possibly want you to take on another one. I had no idea you were teaching at Murdoch as well as UWA. So I think the problem was in my own head far more than in that relationship. I was over overthinking it. And sure enough, he found somebody else who was very qualified to do the job within two days. So I think we take on too much of that emotional burden ourselves and communicating more clearly about what we're doing and what our capacity is, is, is probably key to, to overcoming that, that challenge. Yeah. And I wonder if the, the other two um, panelists might have something to add, because I think, you know, on the one hand, as saying yes to things, because there's a they're a good career opportunity and, and there's often that kind of dilemma but there's also like a, a sense of obligation or helping someone out not wanting to disappoint a colleague or a supervisor Emma or Alfie do you have yeah I, I think so much of what Kat just said there was was really important for everybody and I, I'll tell you from my perspective of where I sit now with my role and having that advantage of I inviting people in um, I'm still you know being invited to things but inviting people in I have to tell you um, I've never been upset with anybody who has said no to me and who has said I'm, I would really love to do this and they've done it in a timely way they've done it in a timely way they have responded in a timely way Said, I would really love to do this, but I can't because of A, B, or C, or they don't even have to tell me why. If they're telling me they can't do it, I know it's because it's 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 not because they don't want to, it's just they can't, you know, we're we're so thinly spread. And they respected me. I would go back to that person in the future. I've not crossed that person's name off of my list, which I think I had that feeling when I was 
younger, in the earlier stages of my career, I was so frightened to say no, because I saw it as a door closing. You're closing that door and, 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 and it will never be able to be open. That's not true. Um, it's about being respectful to that, that process or, or during the process of saying no. So I think that's important. But the other thing that I would raise that Kat raised is if we're saying yes to too much, um, the quality of our work really suffers. And I have found that myself where I have put together something and I've gone back and I've looked and I've thought that is not, I do not want that going out. That is not what I want going out. I'm really unhappy with that. But it's because I've said yes to too many things. I had to, I said yes to something that I had to turn around and say no to. And to me, that's the worst. I never had to do that. I had to do it and I never want to do it again. So it is very much about really thinking carefully about, um, you know, what you say yes. And, and if it's done in that respectful way, there's no, there's no harm at all. I just want everybody to be aware of that. Emma, do you have anything to add to that? I think, um, so the, and the prompt you gave us was, how do you manage feeling obligated? For example, if a friend, a close colleague or a supervisor requests something from you and thinking about it, a friend, a, you know, a close colleague or a supervisor, they're all people that should have your best interests at heart, right? So I think, um, you know, if it, you know, if somebody does ask you to do something and, you know, something kind of doesn't feel right, Think about that, you know, sort of does this person, is this person supposed to have my, you know, my best interests at heart is, is something to, to think about. And if it doesn't feel right, then something is probably off is what I would, you know, um, I think the, the, the handful of times that I would say that I regret saying yes to something, I knew that something kind of wasn't quite right, but I wasn't able to, to articulate what it was, or um, sometimes I, you know, sort of outrightly knew what it was, but I just sort of dismissed it because sometimes, you know, it is easier to, to say yes. And I think um, just picking up on what Kat and Alfia said, I think that there's some value in um, thinking about, you know, if, you, if you're trying to say no to something or, you know, sort of rushing to that, you know, sort of emotional, you know, you're having this sort of emotional reaction to try and sort of unpack that a little bit, you know, sort of why am I feeling this way? Why am I feeling like I should say yes? Or why am I feeling guilty that I, I don't want to do this, but, you know, sort of I'm trying to figure out how I can fit another 15 hours in my week or whatever it is, um, you know, spending some time trying to, to unpack that a little bit, I think um, is, is helpful. Um, just because it can help you figure out exactly what it is that's going on without it just being that sort of initial kind of reaction that you're trying to on this. But just thinking for someone in the audience who's wondering, how, how do you say no? What, like, you know, someone asks you, I mean, you can respond by email. Like, what, what do you say? How do you say it? Um, I think I, you know, if I, if somebody asks me to, you know, sort of do something and I don't have the capacity, I just say, you know, I don't have the capacity, you know, I always sort of say thanks for thinking of me. I think for some people, um, this other issue around, especially junior people and students, you know, sometimes, sometimes some of us need to work, you know, some of us need the money. So that's a very different sort of proposition to if you are being asked to do something that's a that's a, a nice thing or a, or a maybe thing or a CV filler, as opposed to, you know, do I have enough money in this month or for the next six months or, you know, sort of am I going to have enough income? They're two really different sort of propositions, I think. Um, so, you know, and I think, like Afia said, you know, I've, I've never had anybody sort of react badly when I've said no to something. Um, you know, if I know that other people are, um, you know, students who need work, I'll often sort of um, try and pass it around or pass people's names along and, you know, sort of, um, but I think too, and I think Kat said before, you know, sort of sometimes it feels like a door closing, you know, there can be real benefits to opening that door up for somebody else, you know, sort of, um, I think is, is something to, to keep in mind too. Great, great. I don't know, Alfie, if you were going to add something before or no. So moving away from the no, but to the yes, um, 
you know, so someone's offering you work or a collaboration opportunity, it seems really exciting or worthwhile. Um, what what are the, some of the things you should sort of step back and think about before you say yes? What are some of the questions you should ask or? Um, from a from a student junior perspective, I think one of the really important things, um, you know, is is to think about whether this is sort of a is is this paid work or is it you know sort of some quid pro quo, you know, I'll get a publication out of it, you know, sort of type of a, a situation. And really thinking carefully about that, I think that you know sort of work you should be paid for work. Um, I think that that's really important. So if somebody is, um, you know, sort of has, has an offer with some casual work sort of attached, thinking through what is the work, you know, sort of how many hours is it? Is everything that's that's going to be needed to do the job covered by the hours that are being offered? So, you know, sort of if it's a if it's a research assistance gig, you know, um, is it, you know, sort of recruitment, data collection, analysis, but are they also offering hours for write-up and manuscript revision and all of that sort of stuff? Thinking about exactly what is being, you know, sort of offered in terms of what you'll be paid for is really important to think about. Althea or Kat, do you have something to add? Sure, I could add something to that. And, and I, I first like to begin by agreeing with Emma and saying, yeah, getting paid for the work you do is really important to bear in mind. And while there are things you could do to say support other PhD peers that you might want to you know, give some of your own time for, you do need to at the same time position, position yourself as a member of the workforce and not, not, not allow yourself to be, to be giving um, work to projects that, and particularly teaching, that really should be paid. <laughs> Um, but it's also worth bearing in mind, I think, that sometimes elements of working on a project can be a bit unpredictable, maybe not teaching so much, but if it's a research project, you know, you, you don't necessarily know when you first approached who's going to be involved, how much work's going to be available, especially if the funding, you know, is pending or you're involved in that, you know, from the, from the get-go and you're part of that, 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 that securing funding process. Um, goals and research objectives. Do they always change? <laughs> they seem to always change over the course of, of a project. Um, so I guess you do need to be flexible and accommodate change, but without being a doormat. And that's that, that delicate balance. Um, so maybe the best bet in that situation is to know what your bottom line is. You know, what is this job or this activity worth to you? What are you willing to accept? And what are you not willing to accept? And how do you how do you articulate that at the start, but also as time progresses, having channels of communication that allow you to, to go back to the person you're working with or the team you're working with and say, actually, this is not what I anticipated. And we need to, we need to go back to those early conversations and, and think about whether this fits with what we originally agreed. I would, I would just add to that. I think these are all really valuable um, points that have been raised by Emma and Kat. One of the things that I've, I find I have found throughout my own academic career is that I never had, I never really had a clear vision of exactly, you, you know how some people will say, I want to be, and then they have a role attached to it. Or, you know, and I've never been that person. I've never had, I, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be vice chancellor. No, I've never, <laughs> it's not my aspiration, just putting it out there, but I, I've never had a role attached uh, in, in, a, in my vision of myself. Um, but what I have found useful for me uh, is, you know, when I, and this will sound really corny, so I'm sorry, you know, the, the inside, inside of Althea's brain is corny. Um, I project myself, I, look, I think of myself of, well, who do I want to be, you know, five years from now? How do I envision myself? I know what I value, but how do I, how will I have seen myself grown in that five year, five year period of time? How do I want to be contributing in that space? How do I envision that? That will guide me in what I say yes to. That guides me. Um, not the end 
role, not the end aspiration. And if some of you have it, that's that's fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that that's not been me. Um, but but having that that vision that will guide me. So for instance, when the opportunity came up um, that I could be more involved with Taza Executive, I said yes to that because I very much believe in stewardship. That is a strong value within me. Um, I strongly believe in the importance of this discipline. I strongly believe in the importance of the social sciences and um, humanities and arts. And I strongly believe in the purpose of um, a university in higher education. So when I sort of put these things together and an opportunity comes, you know, for say, for instance, um, becoming um, the president of Taza, well, yes, I'll put my hat in the ring. You know, it's meaningful to me. Yeah, great, that's really interesting. Um, I just wanted to pick up on some of the discussion around paid work. Um, versus unpaid work because I'm aware and Alfia talked about it a little bit earlier that there's a lot of um, you know service obligations that are unpaid particularly peer review um, but also often you know putting on conferences sitting on all sorts of committees you know and for postgraduates in particular when should you start doing these things and what you know when is it reasonable to take on these things I think Emma was suggesting you know, you've got CV sort of filler stuff but yeah, how do you sort of negotiate that? Um, I look this 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 deals with that question of you know you're you're at an early stage of your academic career. It's definitely during a time period where, if you know, if I remember correctly, I felt. Um, I found it extremely difficult to say no. I don't think I said no to anything during that that time period, which was just silly, really. But um, I would say in terms of the advice I would give now for PhD students, say yes to those things that very much, um, re, you know, if you're peer reviewing, if you are running a conference, if you are running a workshop, that strongly relate to the work that you're doing, um, that you are building yourself in a really strategic way, that you've not sort of gone so far out that, I mean, some of that work's really valuable going so far out. It, it can bring, you know, great insight to you. But in terms of taking on the sort of heavy, heavy workload that is not being paid, you need to be really strategic in this. Um, there's usually fantastic outcomes that, you know, that come from that, develop networks, development of CV, so on and so forth. But, um, you know, this is where you really need to be strategic in that, in that unpaid space. Emma or Kat, do you have thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, and I don't know, I, you know, I don't know whether there are any sort of hard and fast rules about these sorts of things, but I think that um, that's really good advice from Althea. Um, but I think to just to think about, um, it's really important to think about the, the sort of the context of the people that you might be working with, paid or unpaid, you know, sort of, and I think it, um, it's good if you can um, ask other people who might have done something similar, you know, sort of particularly if, if they're new or unfamiliar to you, you know, sort of to find a little bit about, um, because different groups of people have different sort of um, types of working cultures and might have different expectations around, you know, hours, efforts, what, you know, time commitment, whatever it is. Um, so I think it can be useful, you know, to think through, um, yeah, and just to sort of find out a little bit more about, you know, um, prospective, um, you know, colleagues in these sorts of situations, it might um, go some way to sort of saving you ending up in a situation where you might feel super resentful because it wasn't quite what you thought it might have been, um, is what I would add there. Excellent, excellent. I might open up to um, others in the, in the Zoom call who might have questions. Um, you can either just come off mic or put your hand up or 
um, or if the panelists have questions. Oh, we've got Ashley. Hi, um, this is probably aimed kind of at all of you and it's um, it just, the, I think it was the very first thing that Althea said um, kind of spoke to me a lot because you mentioned that a lot of sociologists might be especially prone to saying yes when they should be saying no or at least considering saying no out of this idea of us having this passion for what we do and I've noticed that um, that's come up a fair bit um, I've seen it in online spaces but I have also unfortunately experienced it firsthand this kind of shaming when we say no or when we um, dial back a little bit because of this idea that that means that we're not as committed to the work. I have actually had someone say, oh, don't you care about this topic? Like, um, you know, when I said no to something that was only tangentially related to what I do and I just didn't have time for it as well. And I've seen that play out a little bit on Twitter and a few other places like that as well. Um, and I just found that really interesting. And um, I have, it seems like there's a lot more um, open discussion about it these days, which is a very positive thing because people are starting to be more vocal about how like passion is a great thing to have but it can't be the sole driver because um, at the same time, we, all, we also have to eat. We have to take care of ourselves. Um, it does, I think it feeds into us saying um, yes to exploitative situations and people feeling like they can leverage the idea of passion for what we do um, in order to get free labor from people as well. Um, and so I think it's really good that that was acknowledged. And um, I wondered if other people on the panel had um, many thoughts on that issue or have encountered or seen that playing out as well. I haven't, I've never seen that happen. Um, I, I, and I, I'm shocked, Ashley, that someone has said that to you. And I'm sorry for that you experienced that because we clearly, I haven't met, I don't want to make this specific to our discipline because I know that I'll find this across all, you know, I hate these broad brushstrokes I'm using. I haven't met a sociologist that hasn't been passionate about, you know, wanting to have an impact through their work, whether that's within the university or outside of the university, you know, we're it's quite passion driven. Um, so I, I've just, I've never seen, I've never seen that happen. I'm, I'm quite shocked. <laughs> um, uh, I should point out that it wasn't a sociologist. It was an interdisciplinary um, project that I had helped out with a little bit at the earlier stages of, and then they asked me to do something else that was just too far outside of what okay. I do. And um, I yeah. said no for that reason, but also that I was too stretched. And then the comeback was, um, you know, I, I thought you really cared about this topic. You talk about it so passionately, like, are you sure? Like, this will be really good on your CV. They kind of pushed back and then I wow. had to repeat myself, which was a bit awkward. And, I think, yeah, but it wasn't a sociologist. Yeah, I think it speaks to what Emma, what you were saying before. Uh, yeah, I think it's important if you want to just to highlight that again. I think, and I was having a, a conversation with some sort of more senior colleagues around this the other week, and we were having a conversation about how uh, a colleague of mine had been asked uh, to do, I think it was some teaching work, and she said, no, I'm I'm busy, you know, I, I just, I don't have the capacity to do it. And the person emailed back and said, are you sure? You know, are you sure you can't do it? it you, your lecture's so great, it'd be really good. You know, and then there's work generated, right? So you have to kind of manage that emotional, you know, sort of work in the response again, you know, sort of, um, and we had a, a bit of a conversation around how you might, uh, you know, sort of handle that sort of a situation and whether one no email is enough and then you don't have to respond after that or whether you'd follow that up with like, you know, here's somebody else, you know, go and talk to them or, you know, sort of whatever. And there were different opinions about how you might sort of um, handle that situation. But I think the other part of this that we haven't really talked about is that there's a very hugely gendered um, part of this, you know, sort of, and I don't know whether uh the same things would be asked of men as they are of of women in the same way yeah i think that's a really good point emma there is a there is certainly a gender dimension to the volunteering and the asking for free or less well-paid help that, that that comes through very clearly um and that, I think that's common across most institutions. Um, I also wanted to pick up, again, Ashley, I'm sorry you had that experience. It sounds really awful. <laughs> um, 
But this picks up Emma's point about knowing the cultures and the working cultures in the teams that you might be working with. Um, and obviously that's hard to know until you're on the inside, by which point it's possibly too late. Um, but it is worth, I think, taking the time if you're going into something new to ask who's involved and what are the what are the other connections between the people you might be working with and the people you have already worked with because we do operate in a in a very tightly knit and often really political space and having that having that awareness and that sensitivity you don't want to get caught in the middle of something hairy that's got nothing to do with you uh, and I think that can happen. It hasn't happened to me personally, but I've heard of some really nightmare stories for early career researchers and postgrads who have got caught between um, more senior clashes and, and were not, uh, not prepared for the emotional work and the, the extra labor or disappointed Um, poor outcomes for the opportunity that that entailed. So again, having taking the time before you say yes to really knowing who you're working with, I think is 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 important. And and probably actually never going back to someone who's <laughs> tried to pull that sort of thing with you in the past. Yeah, I, um, they've since asked me to if I wanted to help out with another grant that they put in, and I ended up saying no. Um, I was a little bit frustrated to see that they put out a publication that included stuff that I'd written, but I. Um, I don't think it's not because it's so far, it is so far outside of what I usually do. And I had stretched myself to assist in the first place. I've ended up, I ended up just letting it go and thinking, I don't know if this is worth the headache. And, <laughs> but usually I would be like, no, you've got to do something. Yeah, about it. Yeah. Recognition of, yeah, recogni yeah. And that recognition of authorship is another really important mm -hmm. thing to consider when going into a project, you know, yeah. negotiating, um, I haven't yet had an experience where I think my writing contribution hasn't been recognized um, and I don't think I've put anyone else in that position um, but it is really common you hear horror stories all the time about people who either do some writing and then are not acknowledged in the, in the ultimate publication or, or things that, that are assumed and then then don't eventuate um, so yeah really really important to know who you're working with as, as far as you can but also to have really clear discussions around what those expectations are what authorship plans are going to look like and then to also after those conversations follow up with an email so that there's a paper trail for every really important conversation that you have during those during those negotiations that's a good point luckily we did do all of that so I do have all of that stuff but it's um yeah. yeah, I think it's really easy when you've just finished your PhD or you're still finishing to be in a position where you feel like you, because it was for me, it was like, oh, I'm going to have a grant on my CV as, you know, even if I'm only CIC or something and I'm only doing a small thing. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it got, it got quite happy. Right? We want to do that stuff. Yeah. So I can see how you can absolutely see how it happens. And I worry about people who don't feel like they can say no or when they get that second email saying, oh, but, but, but. And then they go, oh, well, okay. And then they end up really, really stressed or, you know, you know, working for free in a situation where they could, where they need to be getting paid. And so, um, yeah, lesson learned, big lesson learned. But um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Ashley. I was just going to say, I think on, um, you know, and it's hard to do this sort of when you new and green, but thinking about, um, other people's priorities you know sort of often when you get asked to do something it's a priority for the other person and what does that priority look like and I've been burned you know once or twice about you know sort of agreeing to having uh, to help out with uh, with project work because they've said oh you know and then we'll write it up and there'll be a publication so I've gone okay I'll, I'll do it and then for that publication never to eventuate because the the other person's priorities have, have changed which is you know I mean not um terrible in the long run but it's definitely I wouldn't have said yes if there wasn't a publication or a, you know potential publication attached so um thinking about you know sort of and, and asking those questions you know so sort if of you say that we're going to write it up how concrete is that you know um if, if if it's a publication that you want um yeah that's a great point um Rick I think I saw your hand go up uh, hi everyone um as a new person and postgraduate student wanting to embark on this uh, career one of the things that i'm finding challenging is obviously the current um 
landscape of universities and the problems that COVID has created in sense of an uncertainty. I keep hearing things about funding being reduced and how does how do people like myself um, navigate that space of being involved in trying to, to create our own sense of identity and I guess uh, expertise without burning out, but how do we choose things because is there a future for new academics? Will there be less positions? This is the sort of thing that I feel the uncertainty. Um, and as we move into Zoom technology uh, and it becomes the norm that I'm seeing and classes of you know, large numbers of students, there, is there less need for people like myself coming through the system? So sorry, I'm probably not kind of think clear, but yeah, I'm just curious how, how 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 your people feel about yeah the way things are going at the moment in terms of prospects. I can just weigh in, you know, sort of from a very junior perspective, but I think um, you know, and lots of people around me have been having these sorts of conversations recently um you, you know and i think um you know the the very kind of um linear academic trajectories will become there'll be fewer of those i think overall but i think you know there are you know the the sort of even teaching you know sort of but the research enterprise you know requires people you know highly skilled people to to keep those wheels turning you know not everybody's going to be able to be you know sort of first author superstars but the the whole enterprise will always need highly skilled people to to keep you know to keep research going so i think that there will be jobs but i just think that they might look a little different to how um they have looked in the past perhaps yeah i would i would add to that we we you know thank you rick for for your question I think that we are at a difficult space. I think, you know, we've had a number of crises over the last few years. Uh, and one of them is, you know, beyond COVID and sorry for the light, I had to go find a classroom I could hide in. Um, one of them is the way that the federal government, um, the narrative of the federal government in regards to the function of a university and then also the position of uh, humanities, arts and social sciences within that university as well. And so it definitely is a time where, you know, we're in transition. Um, a lot of people can feel threatened. And, uh, but, but what I do find is that there are, there is exceptional work going on across say the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, there's considered work going on in Taza to counter that narrative, to, to speak to the importance. Uh, and I think if you would all see evidence of this, where we're having this really strong repositioning, reinvigoration, strong sense of disciplinary identities um, that are in response to this. Um, but what I would say in terms of COVID, you know, I wish I had a, um, I wish I had a, a really good sense of exactly where we're going to land. What I will say is that um, within the next three years, if you're talking about working within academia, every university has secured funding. Every university has secured funding from the federal government. So the next three years, whilst there's going to be some, um, problems because of what's happening with international students and the financial impact of that on universities, the funding from the government is solid. So I think you've got this opportunity within the next three years um, to still be developing yourself. It's after these three years that when that funding is not, it's, it's, it's going to be delivered in a really different way um, that, that, um, you know, we, we just need to be really active in this space. This is a time where we really need to be active, reimagining and sort of reasserting uh, ourselves, I think. Um, you know, and, and the, the question you asked, Rick, about what, what, what can I do for myself? I, it, you know, you know the area of your expertise. 
um, you go and you pursue them yourself, you know, and, and really sort of build yourself and build your network. Um, I know that's a really basic type of answer, but I, I, I think that it's, that it's useful. Um, I just wanted to add as well to that, um, you know, I think there could be a feeling that there might be less opportunities at the moment, particularly because there's, you know, there is less casual work, but I think it's still important to feel like you can ask all of those important questions, you know, about, you know, what, what, what's the expected workload, Does, do the hours that are being paid cover all of the work that the, the speakers have sort of um, addressed. Feel like you can still ask those questions so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you take on an opportunity and because i think you can often feel particularly being very junior career that even by asking these questions you're i don't know you're kind of i guess it's that fear of missing out that they might take it away from you or something i've, I've certainly I've had, I've had the great opportunity of um, different research um, assistant opportunities and it feels really, really awkward to ask that question about authorship. It feels really uncomfortable, but I force myself to ask it before I say yes to doing the work because I need to know, I need to have that certainty if the work comes along with the authorship opportunities or if it's that you know, that different kind of model of, you know, you might collect the data, but then they don't include you um, so that you at least know what's what's up. But it feels really awkward. So I don't want to under, I don't want to uh, undermine the kind of emotional side of it, but just know that by asking those questions so that you can make an informed decision, that's, that's actually really important for your career. Um, I don't know if anyone else thought we have a comment. I'll just check if anyone else has a question they wanted to jump in with. But if I think Annette's I get, got a question. Annette. Hi. Um, thank you to all the panellists. It's been very, very useful conversation since I'm right at the beginning of my career. Um, so um, especially Elfia for the for the whole saying that, you know, if you say no, you're going to be ticked off the list. You know, that's just one of the biggest fears. So thank you for just saying that. And Emma, about, you know, following your instincts. Yeah, it's, it is, you have to just go, how does this feel? And Kat, about the matrix map, that was really good. I do mind maps a lot. So I thought that was a really cool um, suggestion. I do have a question. Though. So um, what do you go, so, so you've been asked, to do a project or be part of a project. What do you think about responding by saying, could I have some time to think about it? I mean, is that is that cool or is that being a bit, yeah. you know? Yeah. I often am asking people to, to do teaching, you know, sort of for my subjects and things. And if they say, oh, can I just have a week to get my head around what, what I've got, you know, happening over the next semester, it's completely fine, you know, and I don't want someone to take it on you know, when it's, you know, out of obligation or when they're going to struggle. And I always think that there's room to sort of negotiate, you know, sort of if you want to do all the face to face, but only half the marking, I'm happy to consider that, you know, sort of because I can find somebody else that's, you know, I'd prefer people to be happy, you know, or feel comfortable um, rather than to feel kind of overburdened and overworked because then, as Alfie said, the quality is not going to be as, as good, you know, so I think that that's fine. Yeah, I thanks know. for that. I'd just like to pick up on what Emma said there around, um, you know, being being open as the person who's asking people to do things as well. Increasingly, I find I'm asking people to do things rather than being. I mean, I'm still being asked, but it's it's more of a two way thing now. And what Emma said about have, uh, giving people time to think in response to your question, but also being flexible around what components of the work one person can do and another person uh, might be able to contribute is 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 also really good. Um, I think when you're doing the asking as well, it's nice to give people the space to negotiate and the, giving people an out almost. And, and one way I think you can do that is by explaining you have a plan B, so to speak. I, I don't mean in like a mean spirited, oh, well, if you don't do it, I'll get your nemesis to do it instead kind of way. But instead, 
just expressing that they're your first choice, but that you have others in mind and that they won't be letting you down if they can't do it. And, and maybe it's really nice. I, I think, as Emma said, it's nice to be able to pass work on to other people if you're asked to do something and, um, and you can create an opportunity for somebody by saying no. But at the same time, when you're doing the asking, demonstrating that by saying no, they're giving somebody else an opportunity. And, and if it's appropriate, telling them who that person might be, who you might contact, what you'll do, or asking for their advice about who the next person to ask could be is a, is a really good way to, to help someone feel like they're part of the solution um, and not left feeling like they're either gonna overstretch themselves or create a problem for you by saying no. So that's, that's maybe one, one useful approach. Um, I just, before we leave, cause I can see the time, I just wanna respond to Ashley's comment in the in the chat because I think it's important. Ashley's pointing out um, the pressure, the pressure to produce, and that that also becomes the difficulty uh, of saying of saying no. But I think what came out from the panel discussion today was more the strategic yes, and and the strategic yes where you are really being clear about how you are building yourself and your expertise. Um, and I know that there's going to be, you know, that we, we have many different parts of our work. We have teaching, we have research, we have service, we have, um, and all of these have all the, the um, that, that, that unmeasured and unseen work components to it. But it, it is hard out there right now um, uh, the sector is hard and it's a really competitive place, but to have the strategic yes and don't feel devalued because it is so competitive and it's because there are so many brilliant um, sociologists out there, so many brilliant emerging scholars that are there, which, you know, gives me great faith, but it, it, it is hard. It is hard, but don't feel devalued. Um, that, that would be my last bit of advice there. Great, I think that's a fantastic note to end on. Um, I'd just like to thank our panelists, Kat, Emma and Althea, um, and also thank Sally, um, Sally, M, um, sorry, Dorinda and um, Laura for helping to put together um, and look forward to seeing you at our, our next postgrad grad of Thursday. And if you have any ideas of topics um, that you'd really like to see us address, feel free to send us a message as well. Um, Cause that really guides us. Thanks everyone.